bridging the gap between science and diplomacy, developing new tools for bi-race assessment, thinking about implications that emerging technologies have for the proliferation, development, and use of biological weapons, and empowering the next generation behind us to pursue these career paths and be interested in biosecurity. So that's why I'm watching this year Doomsday Clock announcement. Hello. My name is Archbishop John Wester, Archbishop of Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I'm speaking to you from the Archdiocese. Recently, I published a pastoral letter, Living in the Light of Christ's Peace, a conversation toward nuclear disarmament. Some have told me that it's naive to think that we can live without nuclear weapons. I'm convinced it's far more naive to think we can live with nuclear weapons. And that's why I'm watching this year's Doomsday Clock announcement. I'm S.J. Beard. I'm an academic program manager at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. I work on developing new methodologies for studying extreme and unprecedented future events that threaten human extinction and civilization collapse. And I'm really interested to see how the bulletin weighs up the risks from nuclear war, climate change and disruptive technologies. Hi, I'm Lalita Sundaram. I'm a senior research associate at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. I work on biological hazards, both natural and man-made. I'm particularly interested to see how the Doomsday Clocks announcement reflects the past few years of the pandemic we've been living through. Uh, I'm Hayden Belfield. I also work at CESA at the University of Cambridge, uh, mostly on uh, the risks from artificial intelligence. And I'm particularly interested in what they say about disruptive technologies. And that's why we'll be watching this year's Doomsday Clock update. Hi, my name is Camelia Forbes and I'm a second year master's student and president of the student body here at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. As part of my program, I am pursuing a certificate in global conflict which emphasizes the need for peace and coalition building among nations. As nuclear war becomes a constant threat in conflict, especially in the growing war between Russia and Ukraine, the further we move away from midnight, the closer we as society can move towards more safer and sustainable methods. This is why I'll be watching the Doomsday Announcement. Hello everyone, I'm Mitzi Jonel Tan, a climate justice activist from the Philippines with Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, or YACA. And my country is one of the most vulnerable in the world to the climate crisis, yet we barely contribute to it. We're not able to adapt, transition to our renewable energy system, or manage the loss and damages that we have because of the historical and ongoing over-exploitation of our country and the global south by the global north. We need systemic change, and we can only achieve that through collective action. And that is why I'm watching this year's Doomsday Clock announcement. Hello, my name is Polina Sinovets. I'm the head of Odessa Center for Nonproliferation. I am studying nuclear deterrence, which has become highly relevant due to the Russia's war against Ukraine. This is why I am watching the Doomsday Clock announcement. I'm Rachel Bronson, President and CEO of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's virtual press conference hosted at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. 
I'd like to start by thanking President Mary Robinson and President El Bagdorsh Chakia of the Elders for joining us today. I would like to thank the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago for its ongoing partnership and for serving as the Bulletin's home institution. I would also like to thank our many supporters, foundations, corporations, and individuals from around the world who make opportunities like today possible. My colleagues and I join you this morning to update you on the 2023 time of the Doomsday Clock. The Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists sets the Doomsday Clock each year to answer two important questions. Is humanity safer or at greater risk this year compared to last year? And is humanity safer or at greater risk this year compared to the more than 75 years we have been asking the question? The time on the doomsday clock represents the judgment of leading science and security experts about the threat to human existence with a focus on man-made threats, nuclear risk, climate change, and new disruptive technologies, including biotechnologies. We at the Bulletin believe that because humans created these threats, we can reduce them. But doing so is not easy, nor has it ever been. And it requires serious work and global engagement at all levels of society. The Doomsday Clock was created in 1947 and has become one of the most powerful and most recognized graphic representations. Since its inception, the Bulletin's Doomsday Clock has, moved, has been set closer and farther away from midnight. In 2020, we set the clock the closest it has ever been to midnight at 100 seconds. It has been set as far away as 17 minutes to midnight at the end of the Cold War. The reasoning for why we set the time where we do can be found in our annual statement that accompanies our announcement and is available on our website. Today, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists is releasing its 2023 statement, which will be available shortly at thebulletin.org. Following the announcement of the time, we will proceed to hear from experts and world leaders about why we set the time where we did and what we can do about it. In 2020, when, the, when we first set the clock at 100 seconds to midnight, I stood before you and noted that the world had entered the realm of a two-minute warning, a period when danger is high and the margin for error is low. I noted then that the moving of the clock closer to midnight moves us into a period that requires newfound vigilance and focus from leaders and citizens alike. The move from minutes to seconds emphasizes our proximity to midnight. When the Science and Security Board kept the clock at 100 seconds to midnight in January 2022, we called out Ukraine as a potential flashpoint in an increasingly tense international security environment. We noted that without swift and focused action, truly catastrophic events were more likely. And then when the clock stands at 100 seconds to midnight, the moment is both perilous and unsustainable. In February 2022, weeks after our announcement, our fears were borne out when Russia invaded Ukraine. In March of 2022, the Bulletin issued a statement that condemned the illegal and dangerous invasion of Ukraine by Russia and called on all countries to denounce Russia's actions and President Putin's outrageous threats of nuclear use. Russia's thinly veiled threats to use nuclear weapons remind the world that escalation of the conflict by accident, intention, or miscalculation is a terrible risk. The possibilities that the conflict could spin out of anyone's control remains high. As UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez warned this past August, the world has entered a time of nuclear danger not seen since the height of the Cold War. The war's effects also undermine global efforts to combat climate change as countries dependent on Russian oil and gas have expanded investment in natural gas, and Russia's false accusations that Ukraine planned to use radiological dispersal devices, chemical weapons, and biological weapons take on a new meaning as well. The continuing stream of disinformation about bioweapons laboratories in Ukraine raises concerns that Russia itself may be thinking of deploying such weapons. There is no clear path for forging a just peace that discourages future aggression under the shadow of nuclear threat. The U.S. government, its NATO allies, and Ukraine have multitude of channels for dialogue. We urge leaders to explore all of them to their fullest ability. With this in mind, 
we are releasing today's statement in English, Russian, and Ukrainian. It is the first time we have done this, and we hope it garners the attention it deserves in the capitals most affected. Joining us to reveal the 2023 time on the doomsday clock are Siegfried Hecker, Chair of the Bulletin's Board of Sponsors, Director Emeritus of the Los Alamos National Laboratory, and a Professor of Practice at Texas A&M University and the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. Daniel Holtz, Co-Chair of the Science and Security Board and a Professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Chicago. Sharon Squassoni, Co-Chair of the Bulletin Science and Security Board, Research Professor at the Institute for International Science and Technology Policy at the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. Mary Robinson, Chair of the Elders and former President of Ireland. El Bagdor Takia, Member of the Elders and former Prime Minister and President of Mongolia. Today, the members of the Science and Security Board move the hands of the doomsday clock forward, largely, though not exclusively, because of the mounting dangers in the war in Ukraine. We move the clock forward the closest it has ever been to midnight. It is now 90 seconds to midnight. Let me now turn the discussion to members of the Science and Security Board to elaborate on the statement in the current time. I'm pleased to welcome members of the Science and Security Board, Steve Fetter, the Associate Provost, Dean of the Graduate School and Professor of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Steve is a recognized expert in nuclear risk and advanced technologies. Suzette McKinney, a Principal and Director of Life Sciences for Sterling Bay and a leading practitioner and an expert in emergency preparedness in urban settings. Shivan Kartha, a senior scientist at the Stockholm Environmental Institute, whose research and publications for the past 25 years have focused on technological options and policy strategies for addressing climate change. We will then turn to members of the elders, Mary Robinson and Elbeg Dorsh Sakia, to discuss how global leaders must respond to today's dangerous environment. Steve? Nuclear risks increased significantly last year, due largely to Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Putin has repeatedly raised the specter of nuclear use. In launching the invasion, he's, he warned that whoever tries to hinder us should know that Russia's response will be immediate and will lead to consequences you have never faced in your history. A few days later, he ordered Russia's nuclear forces to special combat duty. In announcing the annexation of Ukrainian territories in September, Putin declared that he would defend them with all weapon systems available to us. This is not a bluff. And in case anyone missed the reference to nuclear weapons, he mentioned that Hiroshima and Nagasaki had set a precedent. These nuclear threats were intended to deter direct involvement by the United States and NATO. And the US and NATO have avoided direct conflict. But as careful as the US and NATO might be, the possibility of nuclear use cannot be discounted. Accidents, mistakes, and miscalculations could lead to unintended escalation. And Putin might deliberately escalate if faced with the prospect of defeat, if Russian forces were being pushed out of Ukrainian territory. Putin has given no indication that he's willing to accept defeat. Despite repeated military setbacks, Russia has pressed on with increasingly desperate tactics and aggressive tactics, including reckless attacks on nuclear power facilities and indiscriminate assaults on civilians and infrastructure. Although a nuclear attack would serve no military purpose and would make Russia a pariah, 
an international pariah and turn Russia and India against uh, Russia, he might make desperate moves if no other options are available that he regards as acceptable. But even if nuclear use is avoided in Ukraine, the war has challenged the nuclear order. The system of agreements and understandings that have been constructed over six decades to limit the dangers of nuclear weapons. Russia refuses even to discuss a resumption of inspections under the New START Treaty. And that treaty, which is the only remaining agreement that limits U.S. and Russian nuclear weapons, will expire in 2026. It will take years to negotiate a successor treaty, but it's difficult to imagine making progress in the current political environment. Russia violated the Budapest Memorandum, under which Ukraine relinquished nuclear weapons in exchange for guarantees that Russia would respect its sovereignty and territorial integrity and refrain from the threat or use of force. If Russia prevails in Ukraine, other non-nuclear countries may conclude that they can't be defended uh, from attack against nuclear armed adversaries, and that could undermine the non-proliferation regime and fuel a new round of proliferation. The impact of disruptive technologies is on full display in the war in Ukraine, from high-tech US weapons to simple but destructive Iranian drones. The expansion of commercial imaging satellites has provided Ukraine with valuable information on Russian troop movements. Russia has increased its control of the press in efforts to spread disinformation, but virtual private networks and Starlink satellites have kept some Russians and Ukrainians connected to the uncensored internet. Although Starlink successfully re uh, resisted repeated Russian cyber attacks, this prompted threats by Russia to destroy the satellites, a threat made credible by tests of anti-satellite weapons by Russia. Looking beyond Russia, we see other reasons for concern. Efforts to resurrect the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action are stalled, and Iran continues to increase enrichment levels in its stockpiles of enriched uranium. Efforts to constrain the North Korean nuclear threat are moribund. North Korea fired more missiles last year than in any previous year, including a next-generation ICBM and a flight test over Japan. And many are anticipating a resumption of nuclear testing. The Chinese nuclear arsenal is rapidly expanding with more than 300 missile silos under construction. Some believe that China is developing a force comparable to that of the United States and Russia, perhaps to deter the US from aiding in the defense of Taiwan. The United States, Russia, and China are all uh, developing large-scale programs to modernize their nuclear forces and are developing hypersonic weapons, setting the stage for a three-way arms race in India and Pakistan continue to expand and modernize their nuclear arsenals. Thus, from almost every perspective, the risk of nuclear catastrophe is higher today than last year. Thank you, Steve. Suzette? Good morning. I'm honored to be with you today to speak with you about the state of biological threats as seen by our expert members and the considerations with respect to biological threats that contributed to the movement of the doomsday clock to 90 seconds to midnight. We should all continue to be aware that the threat that biological agents pose to American society as well as the international community. The existing biological threats landscape makes clear that the international community needs to improve its ability to prevent disease outbreaks, to detect them quickly when they occur, and to respond effectively to limit their scope. Nearly three years after the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the world continues to experience the fallout from this disease with no clear end in sight, despite hundreds of millions of dollars that have been spent globally to combat the devastating effects of this disease. Events like COVID-19 can no longer be considered rare, once in a century occurrences. The total number and diversity of infectious disease outbreaks has increased significantly over the last 40 years, with more than half caused by zoonotic diseases, that is, disease originating in animals and transmitted to humans. As such, zo zoonoses put the human population at significant risk for pandemics, and the world's ability to predict 
which of these viruses and microbes are most likely to cause human disease is woefully inadequate. We live in a time of revolutionary advances in the life sciences and associated technologies. Researchers can engineer living things to acquire new traits with increasing ease and reliability, especially viruses that can be synthesized de novo in the laboratory. Laboratory accidents, which continue to occur frequently, also pose a significant risk. The opportunity for human error, coupled with issues with comprehensive governmental oversight and confusion about lab safety requirements, escalate these risks. Oversight regimes, strategies for risk assessment and risk mitigation, and the establishment of agreed upon norms for scientific pursuit lag further and further behind as biological science and technology advance faster and faster. On the international front, Russia, North Korea, and Iran all continue to maintain biological weapons programs or the ability to research and develop biological weapons for offensive use. The risk that Russia will deploy biological weapons against Ukraine continues to escalate as conditions there become more and more chaotic. This is undoubtedly an existential threat to humanity. No matter the potential source, whether natural, accidental, or intentional, there are steps that national leaders can take to reduce catastrophic biological risks. Every country must make greater investments in public health. Every country should eliminate biological weapons and dismantle programs producing them. And all countries can vastly improve the world's ability to identify outbreaks before they become epidemics and pandemics if they invest in disease surveillance systems, share data, analytics, and intelligence on biological events and develop the ability to identify and attribute biological events quickly. Disease knows no boundaries. Debilitating illness, widespread death, and disease-induced disaster can be avoided if countries around the world cooperate on global health emergency strategies and make investments in science, technology, research, and development in the biosecurity sector. Thank you. Shivan. Thank you, Rachel. Dealing with climate change calls for faith in the notion of global cooperation and in those institutions of multilateral governance that are meant to bring countries together. The invasion of Ukraine, as any war does, has opened up a geopolitical fissure, weakening the global will to cooperate and undermining confidence in the durability or even the feasibility of the broad-based multilateral cooperation that climate change demands. Russia is only second to the United States in global production of both oil and gas. Consequently, the invasion of Ukraine has sparked a, ru a rush to establish independence from Russian energy supplies, particularly in the European Union. From the standpoint of climate change, this has contributed to two countervailing dynamics. First, the elevated energy prices have spurred investment in renewables and motivated countries to put policies in place to support renewables. The International Energy Agency now projects that wind and solar energy will approach 20% of global power generation five years from now, with China installing nearly half of that new renewable capacity. At the same time, however, High natural gas prices have driven a frenzied push to develop new natural gas supplies, spurring investment in new gas production and export infrastructure in the United States, the EU, Africa, and elsewhere, largely financed by major oil and gas transnationals and investment firms. This private capital continues to flow into developing new fossil fuel resources, even while public finance is facing rising pressure to pull out. The high gas prices have also pushed an immediate term shift to coal in power plants, leading this past year to be a record high for global coal consumption. Notwithstanding these two pressures, both of which should in principle reduce demand for Russian gas, 
Russia was on course in 2022 to earn considerably more than the previous year from its oil and gas exports, largely owing to European demand. As a consequence of this, global carbon dioxide emissions from burning fossil fuels, after having rebounded from the COVID economic decline to an all-time high in 2021, continued to rise in 2022 and hit another record high. A decline in Chinese emissions was overshadowed by a rise in the US, in India, and elsewhere. With emissions still rising, weather extremes continue and were even more clearly attributable, attributable to climate change. Countries of West Africa experienced floods that were among the most lethal in their histories, owing to a rainfall event that was 80 times more likely to occur because of climate change. Extreme temperatures in Central Europe, North America, China, and other regions of the Northern Hemisphere last summer caused water shortages and soil drought conditions that led in turn to poor harvests further undermining food security at a time when Ukraine, the Ukraine conflict has already driven food price increases. Pakistan faced this year's most dramatic sign of our increasingly volatile climate. Intense floods due to what was called a monsoon on steroids that inundated one third of the country. The flooding was described as the worst in the country's history affecting 33 million people directly and unleashing cascading effects, including a major crop failure, an epidemic of waterborne diseases, and the destruction of infrastructure, homes, livestock, and livelihoods. Against the backdrop of this year's climate-related tragedies, the UN climate regime took a promising step forward at its annual negotiations in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. The parties at the UN climate conference reached a compromise agreement to create a fund to support poor and vulnerable countries in addressing the mounting toll from climate change. To reach the intended goal, the cooperation that led to this agreement needs to continue in the coming year when countries take up the question of actually contributing money to the fund. Countries were unable, however, to adopt a formal decision to agree to phase out fossil fuels. And even more disappointingly, they did essentially nothing to assure that previous commitments to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions would actually be fulfilled. Thank you, President Robinson. How do we respond? Well, thank you, Rachel, and thank you to the eminent speakers who have uh, preceded me. Uh, it is a privilege to be back in uh, Washington for this year's unveiling of the Doomsday Clock. And I'm very glad to be joined by President Elbeg Dorch. Um, he's the newest member of the elders and our first Asian former head of state. And he brings a valuable perspective uh, on geopolitics, on promoting nuclear disarmament, which his country has done, and tackling climate change in global multilateral fora. And we'll hear from him shortly on the issues of the nuclear threat and the war in Ukraine. The challenges outlined by today's announcement by the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists could not be more global in nature. No one country can tackle them on their own. No matter how large their population, how strong their economy, or how feared their military. Three years ago, in January 2020, like you, Rachel, I stood here when the hands of the clock were moved to 100 seconds to midnight. I said at that time, we are faced by a gathering storm of extinction level consequences and time is running out. Little did I know then that the gathering storm of threats would also include the devastating COVID-19 pandemic, the consequences of which we're still facing today, and the illegal invasion of a sovereign state by a nuclear armed permanent member of the UN Security Council. This, together with the acceleration of the climate crisis, explains why the clock has now been moved even closer to midnight. The threats are even more acute and the failures of leadership even more damning. We live today in a world of interlocking crises, each illustrating the unwillingness of leaders to act in the true long-term interests of their people. The climate crisis, nuclear proliferation, and pandemics 
all demand a crisis mindset from leaders. We need urgent multilateral action and bold ethical leadership. Frankly, we're not seeing it. If one person could be said to embody bold ethical leadership, then for me it would be our founder, Nelson Mandela. He discerned these threats and the need for a collective response when in 2007 he founded the Elders, the group of independent former world leaders of which I have the honour to be chair. We need leaders like Mandela again today. The existential threats we face need his sense of urgency and need his spirit of humanity. As elders, we dedicate our time to seeking solutions and solidarity on the climate crisis, on pandemics and on nuclear weapons. We call for a renewed focus on what world leaders must do to address these global challenges. None will be overcome by the hollow promises of populism or naively utopian demands. They require hard practical choices and a long-term commitment of resources and political capital. Alongside some immediate steps decision makers can take in the months ahead. Well, there have been some recent signs of progress and uh, there was mention of loss and damage and agreement at the, at the COP, and, but a lack of other agreements. Um, <sighs> lasting change will only come when states actually deliver upon and implement their commitments. The United States and other G7 countries need to be held to their pledge to end all inefficient fossil fuel subsidies by 2025 and lead the world in accelerating the transition to net zero. At the same time, the international finance institutions, including the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, need to be re-engineered to help raise the trillions of dollars needed to support vulnerable countries and tackle the climate crisis, as proposed under the Bridgetown Initiative by Barbados, Barbados's uh, Prime Minister, Mia Motley. Equity and solidarity must also be the hallmarks of the world's continuing response to COVID-19 and efforts to prevent and prepare for future pandemics. Strong political leadership is required from heads of state and governments to implement the recommendations of recent independent panels into COVID-19. This should include supporting and strengthening the World Health Organization and a concerted push for a new pandemic treaty to address systemic barriers to equitable access to vaccines, diagnostics and therapeutics underpinned by significant financial investment. This is a daunting global agenda that demands urgent action in the hands of the doom, uh, if the hands of the doomsday clock are not to tick down remorselessly to midnight itself. World leaders must seize the initiative and must deliver for their people. And whilst these challenges may seem insurmountable, we have no choice but to act. As Nelson Mandela himself said, it always seems impossible until it is done. Thank you. Thank you. President Albrecht Dorsch. Thank you, President Robinson, Rachel, and other speakers. I came from Mongolia, and uh, I'm wholeheartedly honored to be here to participate in this profoundly important event today. You know, I, I remember my childhood. I lived in, uh, in, in Mongolia in a remote herdsman village. During that time, almost half centuries ago, we were the 10 and 12 years old boys and girls shouting that no war, no nuclear weapons, and we want to live. That was almost 50 years ago. But now I'm really honored to what say the to the village of humanity, you know, there, there are existential threats. We are really closer moved to the doomsday. And, uh, and, and when I see that village to humanity, uh, now I'm honored to say from this stage today. And uh, also this existential threats outlined today should be a cause for alarm for every citizen on earth. And even more alarming is the continued failure 
of decision makers to rise to the challenge despite urgent warnings they hear year after year. Also, I would like to remind here one story from our human history. You know, there is a city called Pompeii in modern Italy, and people lived there 2,000 years ago, and there was Mount Vesuvius actually erupting. And that actually continued for 18 hours, and people kind of used to that. But after that, that six meter, 20 feet high, melted lava came to the town and buried it. Now I see that uh, we see more Mount Vesuvius near to our human villages. Mount Vesuvius is related with the wars, with the nuclear weapons, nuclear threats, and uh, that pathogenic threats, and uh, pandemics, also with the, with the climate crisis. There are one more mountain is rising. It's like a, a more uh, related with the disruptive technologies. And people and scientists are, are warning us. And we have to wake up now for the call of these people. And I think science is not nationalistic. Science is universal. And they are calling us. And we all know that. Uh, doomsday clock, when it was uh, far in, in, in 1991, 17 minutes to the midnight. If you see the 17 minutes in terms of the seconds, it's 1,020 minutes. Now that actually moved to the 90 minutes. Since, you know, 17 minutes, it's almost, yeah, yeah 17 minutes is, is almost uh, 10 times closer. To the, to the midnight. And uh, I think uh, this is why the urgency of the interconnected and uh, existential threats we face it requires a crisis mi mindset from our leaders. And around the world, all we mentioned, I, I don't want to repeat those threats. And uh, I think these are now, we, we cannot continue uh, now business as usual. We need to wake up. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have some questions coming in um, from the press. And this one is from um, Ivan Pilchikov at TASS Agency, Russian Media. And I'm going to turn it first to Steve and then to President Al Bagdorsh. The first, the first question is, the U.S. and its allies are currently discussing sending Western tanks, additional long-range weapons and Western fighter jets to Ukraine. How, in your opinion, this is for Steve, how, in your opinion, does it affect the prospects for resuming of the U.S.-Russian strategic dialogue on arms control, and does it increase the risk of nuclear conflict? Before you answer, I'm going to then turn it over to President al George, who has engaged directly with President Putin um, when he was serving as president in Mongolia, sitting between um, some, some pretty powerful neighbors. So first, Steve, if you could take that first question, and then I'll pass it over to President Albeck Dorsch for some thoughts. The U.S. and Russia have a strong shared interest in avoiding nuclear war and in minimizing nuclear risks, and we should be able to pursue this, uh, this shared interest despite the war in Ukraine, just as we did during the darkest days of the Cold War. U.S. military assistance uh, to Ukraine may complicate those efforts, but as I alluded in my remarks, I think it is essential for the long-term risks of, uh, of nuclear war, nuclear proliferation, that Ukraine is able to resist uh, the invasion and, and repel uh, Russian forces. And uh, so we, we should do everything we can uh, to support Ukraine in that. President Albrecht I think uh, uh, President Putin attacked Ukraine uh, not because of uh, his reasoning today uh, he, he's talking about, and he, he actually attacked Ukraine. Uh, my understanding is if free Ukraine succeeds, it might be bad for Russians. And because of that, I think, he attacked Ukraine. 
And uh, from the first day, when there was started full invasion of Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian leadership asked for more weapons. I think uh, Ukraine has uh, every right to exist, every right to defend. And that fiery front line in uh, Ukrainian war, not only that front line runs between Russia, Russia and Ukraine, I think it runs between autocratic world, between free world. And uh, Ukrainians are not only defending their territory, I think they are defending world security, global uh, quest for freedom. And uh, when, uh, when the Western allies give them more weapons to Ukraine, there seems more succeeding. When there are more tanks, when, when you give more javelins against tanks, they are succeeding. If you, when, uh, when you give the more aircraft, anti-aircraft weapons, there are no longer, you see, no longer the fighter jets or attacking helicopters. But now that entrenched, you know, uh, aggressor, in order to fight with them, I think they need more tanks. And in the, from the start of the Ukrainian war in Ukraine, now there are triple number, 333 days, exactly today. 333 days, they are defending their country and defending world security and freedom. I think they need more tanks. That wounded, fatally wounded Ukraine has no time to wait. When there is a rape happening, when there is healings happening, when there is coming to their country more destruction, they have no time to wait. I think they need more support, more weapons, more tanks. Thank you. The second question is from Seth Borenstein that I'm gonna take the answer to and then I'm gonna pass it over to President Robinson. The second question from Seth Borenstein at the Associated Press. You've been saying for decades we are mere minutes from doomsday, yet here we are still going. What is different this time and what should the public believe? is different. The point of the clock is to assess where humanity is, whether we're safer or at greater risk. And as we move the clock closer to midnight, we are sending a message that the situation is becoming more urgent. We need to spend more attention, that crises are more likely to happen and have broader consequences and longer standing effects. So with that, when we move it away the pub from midnight, the public can believe that their engagement and their power in influencing their leaders is having an effect. And we're in a situation now where leaders aren't doing what they need to. And we need the public desperately to make sure they focus on these key issues about advancing technologies, not only the benefits, which we'll turn to in a moment, but the risks as well. And so what we're conveying with this clock move is things are not going in the right direction. And they haven't been going in the right direction. And those out who are listening say, like, it doesn't feel safer today. They're not alone. We're very concerned about this. So everybody, no one can do this alone, but everyone can do something. And with that, we hope that the moving of the clock, as we assess where the threats are, is a motivator that we all need to pay attention to these key issues. So with that, I'd like to turn it to President Robinson about what world leaders can do and whether you see this moment as more urgent as we do when we set the clock. Very much so, Rachel. Um, the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences has done its job. It's provided us with the evidence-based reason why we are now 90 seconds from midnight, the closest the doomsday clock has ever been to midnight. Wake up, leaders, and that's the call. And that's why the elders are urging a crisis mind to deal with the multiple crises, the nuclear crisis, the climate and biodiversity crisis, the pandemic crisis. And we actually know what to do in each of those. And these are global solutions that are needed. We need a longer term vision on the part of leaders. And we need to, you know, to find a way to really understand that we're talking about humanity. Um, in many ways, 
these years leading up to 2030 from a climate and biodiversity perspective are probably the most important years in human history because either we will do what the scientists are telling us to do or we will condemn future generations to a terrible world. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable that we would do that. During COVID, we listened to medical experts. Uh, we knew, countries knew that unless they listened to the epidemic, I can't even pronounce the word, never mind, um, listened to the medical experts and you know, um, had the vaccines roll out, etc., that we were in real danger. Um, why can't we listen now um, just as well to the scientists who are telling us in unequivocal terms how serious it is? Leaders, wake up. This is your responsibility. This is on your watch. Thank you. I'm going to turn the last question to Suzette and Shivan. Um, and this, this comes in, this is the closest we've ever been to midnight, but are there any bright spots that you want to highlight? Any areas of hope? Let me go to um, Shivan. I'll go to you first, and then Suzette, you can take us home. One thing that's happened that we can definitely take some heart in is that there has been tremendous expansion in the in innovation around renewable energy and in deployment as in and in policies that will support the further expansion of renewable energy. And renew, renewable energy is set to be the largest um, the largest group of energy sources in the fairly near future, in the next five years or so, and that's compared to coal, which has been you know dominant source of, of electrical power. Um, so that's that's definitely something to take heart in. Um, a second thing to take heart in is that, like various other problems, climate change is in some ways a generational problem. There's a generation that's growing up now, a generation that will be our leaders in the future, that is um, fired up about climate change, so to speak. They're very concerned about it. They're concerned about it as a personal issue. We, our generation, has been talking about climate change as a problem for future generations. This is the future generation that is coming up now and that will see the, the potential very dire impacts. And so their, their motivation and their energy and their seriousness about climate change in a way that the uh, former generation hasn't been, as President Robinson was saying, um, that's something to, to definitely uh, put, some, put some serious hope in. Dr. McKinney. Thank you, Rachel. I would say there are a number of bright spots and areas that give us hope. First and foremost, investment in the life sciences and the will among leading researchers to identify advancements in technology, advancements in the life sciences continues to grow. The COVID-19 pandemic really heightened the need to increase research in these areas and to continue to search for the quest to solve for these very complex public health and medical problems. I also believe that healthcare practitioners are more emboldened to work together and to work alongside policymakers to ensure that we are moving quickly toward the advancement of surveillance systems and other processes that can help us identify these threats much more quickly and respond to them much more appropriately. I do believe that while there continues to be a void in the international community with regards to how quickly these advancements are being made, there is will there to move the, the, the needle, if you will, on advancements. And I think that our leaders need to not become complacent, but continue to recognize and understand the devastating effects of biological threats and the continued need for advancements in research and all areas of the life sciences so that we can begin to improve upon these situations so that we uh, will curb and begin to slow down the negative impacts of biological threats. Thank you. As we come to the end, I want to thank you and thank our panelists uh, and experts and world leaders for joining us for this year's announcement. We've heard some bright spots, ones that we always look for at the bulletin because science, the advancement of science brings such huge potentials. But if we don't figure out how to manage the risks associated with them, it's the risks that will lead us rather than the benefits. And right now, as we heard, 
from President Robinson, Chairman of the Elders, the time is urgent. We really do need creative and bold leadership, ethical, moral, political leadership. We need the scientists around the world to keep working with us and pointing out where the opportunities and threats are. And we need all of you to do what you can at the local level to help make sure that you're doing your part and that le your leaders are hearing from you that time is of the essence. So with the doomsday clock now, thoughtfully and intentionally, at 90 seconds to midnight, there really is no time to waste. Thank you for joining us for this year's announcement. We are adjourned.